my that is for now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this is my presentation, but I do want to first welcome and hello, good morning, friends, family, faculty, staff. Thank you for coming to Heller. Um, I mean Geller today um, to see our presentation. We have three wonderful presenters today. We have worked really hard on these research presentations, so we're really lucky to have you here to come see it. Um, I am Terry, this is Ling, and this is Whitney. You'll learn a little more about them as we move forward with our presentations. Um, just some procedural things for today. We do ask that your phones are silent, and if you want to record, it's actually going to be filmed by our wonderful Annie, so you don't have to necessarily record it, but please feel free to take photos, but keep a safe space for the presenter so they won't be so distracted. Also, since we are having three presentations back to back, we ask that you remain in this room to avoid any dis um, distractions. Um, another thing is questions. Yes, you may have questions during these presentations, but please do wait till the end of the presentations so then the presenter can get through what they're trying to say to you. So, once again, 10 minutes for the presentation, 5 minutes for Q&A. Um, yeah, and now we're about to start. So, my name is Terry, as I have mentioned. I am from Atlanta, Georgia. I, my concentration was in secondary history, one of four in our cohort. Um, small but powerful. Um, and I'm excited to be here today and to present my presentation. So, whenever you make that time. Okay. So, my presentation is Someone Who Looks Like Me, Race as a Motivational Factor. My full name is Tommy Terry Shy Patisserie, but my students know me as Miss Shy, because, you know, that's a very long last name. Okay. All right. So, just to give you a little background about where I taught this year, I was at McDevin Middle School, which is located right here in Waltham, Massachusetts. It's actually one of two middle schools in Waltham. I first started off with my internship in seventh grade, World Geography, with a total of 92 students. And usually the, uh, we have many placements where we go observe different settings, so I would typically go to a high school, but I had the honor and privilege to be hired as the full-time long-term sub to continue teaching as the 8th grade world history teacher with my own 96 students. <laughs> and in both of these grade levels, the classes were mainstream where students who had special needs as well as English language learners were in my general ed classes. While at this school, I paid a lot to the demographics of the students. It was a very diverse population, which is very special and unique to Waltham, and I was honored to be in there. But please do pay attention that the Hispanic and white population were the majority of the school, with African American and Asians being the minorities, but they were still there. Um, but if you look at the statistics for the educators that were there, or the staff, you can see that it's primarily white, 77.9%. The reason why I'm paying attention to race is because in education, I feel like sometimes it's silence for something that's not discussed enough. I'm just trying to bring about the conversation so awareness could be brought to the topic. And also, if you think nationally about these statistics, the National Center for Education Statistics has reported that students of color made up more than 45% of the pre-K to uh, 12th grade population, whereas teachers of color made up only 17.5% of the educator workforce. Another statistic by the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education is more than 80% of the education teaching force is actually dominated by white women. So as a person of color, I wanted to pay attention to race and have my research presentation based on this to see if it motivated my students. So what impact, if any, does my status as a teacher of color have on the motivation and work habits of my students of color? Before going into the process of how I collected my data, I do want to show a survey that I have um, given my students. This is from the eighth grade. I asked them if they had teachers of color other than myself before, and 44.4% of them said no, while 55.6% said yes. However, to make this research more applicable to myself, I am Thai and Laotian, Asian American, so I wanted to ask students if they had another Asian American female teacher other than myself before. As you can see, the numbers have doubled. For no, from 44 to 88.9 percent, they have not had an Asian American female teacher. So to collect more data on my research topic, inside the classroom, I had surveys with the students, both in seventh grade and eighth grade. I had a focal group of students where it was six seventh graders, where I had a discussion with them and asked them questions directly about race. I also had formal and informal interviews with the students, 
And outside the classroom, I continued to collect data by writing down my observations and field notes in my research journal, talking to my inquiry community, which is basically a professional learning community where I got advice um, for any issues that I was having or any areas of improvement or any suggestions. Um, I also had a resource re review. In order to really stay educated on the topic about race and education, I had to read up on a lot of different articles, just so I could be on top of my own game for this time. Um, I wanted to show with you the overall, uh, the overall way that the students felt about me, or overall impact I had with my students at the Denver Middle School. This graph represents my seventh graders, in which I asked them if they felt like I liked them, cared about their learning, and their well-being. A lot of students agreed and strongly agreed. For my eighth graders, I asked if they enjoyed the last quarter with me, and a lot of students agreed and strongly agreed. However, I do want to go to one student in particular in the seventh grade. She was actually Laotian American, one of the only at the Deaf Middle School, which is very similar to my own situation growing up. I was the only Laotian American in my entire middle school and high school besides family members. She was a part of my focal group for the seventh graders, and as I asked them about if they think race is, uh, if race impacts their motivation in schools, she actually stated, seeing you and having you as a teacher here, especially with somebody who looks like me, is like motivational, because I can see someone like me that can make it, that can be successful. It really helps with my motivation to work hard and do better. This picture actually is her right here. This is her mom, this is myself. We're actually at the Laotian Temple in Bedford, Massachusetts. I was able to go because it was a connection that we had, and I myself have been trying to find the Laotian community here in Massachusetts. And her mom was actually able to FaceTime my mom to speak in our language and talk to each other about the Laotian community. And her mom actually stated to me, I'm glad you're in education because not many Laotian Americans are. Okay. However, though I have one student who did share uh, similar identity as me. I had other students of color who are also impacted with me being a teacher of color. In my focal group, I asked students to identify themselves, and the student identified herself as an African American black female. And I asked how many Asian American teachers she had, including I me, mean, yeah, including myself, and she said none other than myself. And then I asked them to describe their favorite teacher, but do not include names, only provide the description and reason, and what was their race and ethnicity. She stated Asian. And she's a very good teacher with hands-on teaching. She's devoted, and even when you don't get a problem, she will still work with you until you get it. She's a fun teacher and can still joke around with you at the same time. <laughs> so with this information, I was able to see that I did impact other students of color, but with different qualities other than my race. So in my eighth grade classroom, where I had my own four classes, I tested out different strategies that I want to do in my future classrooms. So my students actually asked me, they're usually named by color, so we like yellow class, purple class, red class, or green class, but a student came to me and asked, can we get class names? I'm an educator who wants to incorporate student voice, so I said, of course. <laughs> and they started choosing their own names, and they got Lit Class, The Finessers, Lil Boats, inspired by Lil Yachty, and The Grubbers. And I was able to turn the names that they chose for themselves into motivational phrases for success. So Lit for success, finessing for success, sailing towards success, and hungry for success. And they would see this not only here to turn in their work, because definitely they needed to turn in their work, um, <laughs> but also on their Google Classroom platform where they opened it and they will always see this every time they were doing their work. I wanted to really implement um, culturally relevant pedagogy, which is basically valuing the experiences and backgrounds of students into the classroom. I'm also inspired by Dr. Christopher Emden, who actually came here to talk about his reality pedagogy, which is also stems from cultural pedagogy. Another example that I did in my classroom is, besides just incorporating their lingo into demonstrating who they are in the classroom, I once taught a lesson about the Hundred Years' War. If you guys didn't know, the French and the British never had a treaty to end the war, but they ended their beef. And I said that in the classroom, the students was like, what? She just said beef. And in order to elaborate even more, I said beef means like hostility, tension. They're good. So the students were able to really understand what I was trying to say to them, and they were more engaged in the work. Um, at the end of the school year, a student actually, she was a Hispanic eighth grade female student, and she wrote this note to me. Even though we only knew each other for a small period of time, I wanted to thank you. You have convinced me that I can do anything if I put my mind to it, and I've learned more in a short amount of time than in the entire year. 
Thank you for everything you've done, Miss Shy, and good luck next year in Thailand. So she says Thailand because I actually received a full right to go teach in Thailand for a year, starting in September. Um, and due to this, I have found that race can have a large impact on the motivation and work habits of students of color. Race is not the only factor, I mean contributor, for an increase in motivation and work habits of all students. I also had white students, but my research was focused on students of color. Student-teacher relationships play an integral role for student engagement, motivation, and work habits in academic classrooms. And pedagogical practices that are implemented in the classroom can help or harm students of color. Pedagogical practices, teaching practices. Yes. Conclusions or next questions and next steps. Um, from everything that I've learned and all the research that I have done with my readings, I once still wonder, will there be an increase of teachers of colors in schools that have a diverse demographic of students? Should certain pedagogies be required in schools to ensure students of color are supported? Will schools provide proper support for teachers of color in both K-12 schools and university levels? And then a new possible study with living in Waltham, going to school in Waltham, and teaching in Waltham, I'm wondering, does living in the same community where you teach have an impact on student motivation and work habits? And I think I'm going to actually extend this research to why I'm in Thailand, or I'm going to be living where I'm teaching. And with that, that is my research presentation. So I would like to open the floor up to any questions that you may have about anything in my presentation or in general. <laughs> yes. Terry, I think your presentation was amazing. Thank you. Um, I just have a question. Um, could you give an example of a pedagogy that might be under number two, like something that theoretically could be required to support mm -hmm. students of color? Um, well, I think just valuing what students kind of already know, so taking and seeing what students say in the classroom, how they understand the content, don't just dismiss it if it's not like completely relatable to students, but try to spin it in a way where they can make sense of it, and then they can feel validated in the classroom with whatever that they say. Yeah. Yes? So how, what are you planning on taking from this experience in like, um, you know, predominantly white Hispanic school to your school in Thailand next year? Mm -hmm. So I, I am aware that the demographics is going to be way different. It's not primarily going to be teaching Thai students. Um, but with that, I think that with my own desire, personal desire to reconnect my own roots being Thai, um, I think that's just going to be a, um, that's going to help me gain more confidence in my own identity. And then once I enter back into schools, I will know, um, I will be more aware of my own identity while also being aware of like how different backgrounds and different cultures are in the classroom with students and with faculty and just having that conversation to extend my knowledge um, and extend my research to others so they could be aware of how to best support the students. Because at the end of the day, all the research that we're doing is for the students, which is priority. Yeah. Yes. I'm just interested in either in your personal experience or through your research, whether you sort of identified where there could be a bottleneck for, for teachers of color to enter the system, whether it's in you being educated or for getting hired. So you said bottom? Yeah, just sort of why there aren't more teachers of color. Okay. Right? What's what seems to be stopping? Okay. Yes, progress. I get this question. Yeah. Thank you. I just have to make sure. Um, well, I know in my personal experience, like my family kind of really just being immigrants, they just wanted a lot of. They wanted me to have a career that would make me successful, and by successful, sometimes it didn't mean like monetary means. So like being a doctor, being a lawyer. Um, and I think sometimes with that expectation, students don't really pay attention to the teaching field because sometimes it's undervalued, I feel like. Um, and even now, like my parents, she's like, my mom, she's like, are you going to make enough money? So I'm like, <laughs> but I'm doing what I'm passionate about, which is what I care more about. Um, so I think that could be one instance. And then also people not being aware of the issues in education. Because I didn't go to a good school system myself, um, being from Atlanta. Um, we had a lot of education disparities, and we, did not, we didn't have accreditation for some years. So just going into education just wasn't something that I thought of immediately if I wanted to be successful in the society that we live in. Yes. Okay. We still have two minutes if anybody has any questions. But if not, I'm happy to give those two minutes to another presenter. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so we are saying I'm actually good to introduce you. Okay, so the second presentation.
presented that we have for today is Ling Li. She is from China, and she, her concentration was in foreign language China, I mean Chinese. So she's going to be a Chinese language teacher. Um, and yes, she's going to introduce her topic to you. all the teachers, future teachers, parents, and friends. Thanks for coming today. My name is Ling Li. I'm from China. And today my presentation title is Authentic Materials, Another Way to Increase Student Motivation and Self-Satisfaction. I taught 10th grade in Western High School for the, during the last school year. And most of my students have been studying Mandarin for three years. The average language proficiency level of my students varies from knowledge high to intermediate low, um, which means that most of them can handle successfully some daily communicative tasks by creating the language in a very straightforward social situations. And four out of the 15 students are Mandarin native speakers or either heritage language learners. Since I am an international student who has never been studied in, a, in American school, I, have, I was really passionate and have conceived many beautiful things about my students before I came to the school. Especially when I saw the logo of Western High, the Wildcats. <laughs> it reminded me immediately of the high school musical. <laughs> With all the fancy in my mind, I'm ready to start my journey. However, the reality didn't accord with my expectations. After the one month's teaching, I realized what I thought didn't quite meet my students' need. First, I rely really much on the textbook. But the textbook in general do not provide enough contemporary information, such as vocabularies, phrases, and culture to engage students. In addition to that, current teaching content doesn't completely match the common core standards applicable in the other foreign language curriculum frameworks. Last but not least, students are not always able to communicate with the native speakers successfully because of their fluency, the accent, the speed, and idioms. Therefore, the necessity of preparing my student to deal with the real world situation becomes my priority of the teaching goals, and the authentic materials came in my mind first. Many researchers define the authentic materials. For me, authentic materials are not designed for language learners, but for the native speakers of the language to use in their daily life. In my research, I included four types of authentic materials. First, the earlier. Previous year students' storybooks or Chinese money notes. Second, printed textbook. I included movie or train tickets or the restaurant menus. Third, images like photographs and posters. Uh, last, multimedia materials. Reality shows, weather report, or some documentaries. At the beginning of the February, I started to collect my student previous work and uh, handed out my first student feedback survey. At the same time, I also kept a teacher research journal weekly. I, I also looked for some literature and discussed with my mentor to change my strategies. At the end of the research, I did the survey and uh, collect my student work again and interviewed my mentor. After data analysis, I had three major findings. First, student attitude towards different types of authentic materials vary. According to the survey at the end of the research, students like the visual images best, followed by multimedia materials and the realities. This was also confirmed by my mentor based on her observation that students were engaged in the teaching process when they watched movies video clips, and uh, some many train tickets. Although I cannot judge my students' progress according to their scores, because I taught three different topics in three months, 
but I did saw their change in the overall growth. Most importantly, students are more interested in the content than before. The story box on the left are students' work after they saw their upper classmates did. And the, train, uh, the movie tickets on the right side is a classroom assignment which is designed to practice price topic. In this assignment, students not only just review the language, but they also raise many good questions to understand the rest information on the ticket. And also, my mentor said, students are more willing to listen or watch the materials again and again until they understand the content. She mentioned that the first time I played the weather report material, students barely know the information. However, they asked me again and again to play it, and until most of them could write down all the information. And by the end of the unit, they only need to listen to the similar materials three times, which made them really proud of themselves. To my delight, most students tend to complete assignments when they are based on authentic materials. The screenshots on the left side are the assignments based on authentic materials. You can see only, le only less than one-fifth of students didn't finish the work on time. However, if you look at the other side, which were regular assignments, more students didn't finish it in time. Apart from my student progress, I also saw my personal cognitive development during the research process. At the beginning of January, I used some news report to share with my students at the beginning of each lesson, which I thought was really interesting. However, the fact was, the student didn't buy into it. For instance, this I thought Jackie Chen, the Chinese Kung Fu star, is very popular all over the world. However, it turns out he is only the superstar of my generation. <laughs> Therefore, I had to focus more on materials for interesting to my students. This is a reality show in which the two Chinese celebrities met, first met with each other. So in this reality show, the student not only just uh, reviewed the vocabularies and the expression about introduction, but also laughed at some embarrassed moment and also know a little bit about Chinese blind date culture. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I care more about the depth of a material. This is a Chinese environmental protection documentary. I hope it, through this documentary, students could know how environment impacts people's life and the importance of environment protection. To sum up, Authentic materials enable students to interact with real language and content, increase their motivation, and gain the self-satisfaction. Teaching with authentic materials also creates a positive learning environment. Apart from that, the process of researching and implementing authentic materials is a going task which not only benefits my student, but also a great opportunity of my profession and development. However, this is just an experiment of my 10th grade student. Will the result be applicable in other stages and learners? Maybe one day I will know the answer. Thank you. to bring authentic materials into the classroom and how that increased engagement and increased your students' understanding. What do you see as the role of the textbook in a Chinese language classroom, if any? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I still um, need the um, textbook because they are really official and they have many um, grammatic rules and uh, really 
um, beautiful written texts on that. But um, authentic materials will be uh, complementary materials to help me and help the student to engage the language learning journey. And also use their vocabulary phrases to talk with um, real Chinese native speakers. Hi, my name's Larry. Um, that was my daughter, Rachel, back there. <laughs> um, this isn't so much a, a question, but a, a statement. So where I live, um, it's a, a, a not a year-round community. It's kind of a, a population explosion in the summer. So a lot of young people come for summer jobs. And in the last probably seven to 10 years, we've had a lot of um, folks come from Croatia and Russian, the satellite countries. And most of them learn how to speak English by watching videos and um, you know handheld devices, movies, videos, and things like that. And they're very proficient at speaking English. And um, I had one man work for me a few years ago, and I said, how do you speak such perfect English? And he said, you just watch the movie over and over again, over and over again. And, and so there it is right there. It's like we, we, they may not be proficient in writing it and reading it, but the speaking of it. And mm -hmm. that's sort of what you were saying, that you get conversation. They could have a conversation with me like, I could not stump them on a word. Mm -hmm. I said anything in my way to their vocabulary. They never said, what does that mean? They always knew because they never watched. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica. Um, I have a question. Um, 